come to view the request? My dream is to become a hero. I know, I know. Kind of stupid, right? I get that you can't just snap your fingers and poof! You're in a cape with your first initial plastered over your chest. But let's face it, the world we live in could really use some heroes. It's like every day I come across some new sad story. Where's the harm in wishing for more sunshine? Anyways, I know heroes really do exist. I was saved by one. Well, saved might be an exaggeration, but I was a timid little squirt, and he was always there for me. He was just so, so darn cool. I wanted to be brave like him. I wanted to protect people like him. Eventually, my hero left our hometown to become a knight. If I was going to follow in his footsteps, and that meant I needed to take up the old helmet armor, too. Wasn't sure if a weak crybaby like me would ever amount to much. But hey, whoever changed the future by getting hung up on the past? You probably already figured this out, but this hero I've been talking about? None other than my childhood friend, Lancey. And let me tell you, he's like something out of a fairy tale. Brave, smart, strong. Back in the day, all the grown-ups would call him a prodigy. If it wasn't for him, I might have never become the shining knight of Fiendrock that I am today. But man, do I still have a long way to go. I won't stop until I'm the best me I could possibly be. Here's a story from way before I became vice-captain of the White Dragons. One day, I was waiting for Lancey at a harbor in Fiendrock. An hour's passed and he still didn't show. I started to get nervous. The sound of the surf, which had been super calming until then, turned dark and whispery. Weird, but okay. Snooping around. I found out the true dragon Fafnir had returned. The royal powers that be were putting together a force to beat him. And of course, the person leading it was the captain of the White Dragons, Nancy. My best friend was about to march into the jaws of a literal fire-breathing lizard, and he was gonna do it without me. I couldn't let that happen. In a panic, I started back for the capital. So there I was. Rushing along, worried half out of my mind, when I met the Grand Cypher's captain for the first time. Apparently, the crew was also headed for the capital of Fiendrock, so I told him to stick with me. More than Mary, right? Except, I wasn't exactly Mary, and the captain could see that. Unable to stand it any longer, I spilled my heart out. I talked about the divide between me and Lancey. About how all I ever wanted was to be there for him. On and off the battlefield. For every baby step forward I took, Lancey soared. I was weaker than him. Ranked lower than him. I wasn't enough. And this whole Fafnir business had just driven everything home. Everyone had immediately gone to Lancey, asking him to lead the way, save the day. On the other hand, I didn't get so much as a backwards glance, so I was just some random foot soldier. What? I didn't get to whine when my best friend was out there risking his life. I needed to stop feeling sorry for myself and put in the work so I could start feeling proud instead. Lancey's a born fighter and a genius. He's also human. The pressure on him is crushing. I had to get strong enough to support him. Hearing this, the captain asked if I wanted to join the crew. Of course, I would never quit the White Dragons, but maybe a temporary change in direction was what I needed. 
I'd run myself into a rut. New scenery, fresh perspective. All part of a healthy breakfast for a growing boy like me. So I took the offer. Determined to go back to the White Dragons bigger and better than ever. But I digress. Back to the Fafnir problem. All you really need to know is, it spiraled way out of control. The fate of the kingdom hangs in the balance kind of stuff. Thanks to Lancey and the captain, Fiendrock managed to find its way back to normalcy. Me? I've been changed forever. Though we've been fighting a dragon, I ended up learning a lot about people. Their strengths, weaknesses, what scared us, what made us tick. I've had some people pass out of my life and others come into it. My eyes were open to a lot of things. And not all of it pretty. But I'll take it. Because it's the sum of our experiences, the good and the bad, that make us who we are. Fast forward in time, and bam! Your boy Vane's Vice Captain of the White Dragons. Took big dreaming, a lot of hard work, and a hefty helping of best friend anxiety, but I got there. Now, don't get me wrong, rank, titles, all that stuff's just words, you know? What kid doesn't like getting a gold star? And this was a big, shiny gold star that said, Congratulations, you're on your way to becoming a hero. Plus, now I got to be part of all the important security meetings. If Lancey needed help, I'd be the first to know. For once, I was feeling pretty confident in myself. Vice captains have it tough, but I was more than happy to do the work. It wasn't all smooth sailing, though. After a few months, some nasty rumors began circulating through the barracks. People were saying I got my job through nepotism, just because I was friends with Lancey. It was kind of a dark time. I've been trying to come up with things that I accomplished when I realized there were none. At least, nothing that I'd accomplished on my own. This whole time, I'd just been riding on other people's coattails. The captain, as always, lent me a shoulder to cry on, and we agreed to meet up again in a few days. But when the time came, two, um, burlier figures were standing beside the captain, Siegfried and Percival. They were there to spar with me and judge, once and for all, if I deserved to be vice captain of the White Dragons. I definitely teared up a little. These were two of the people I looked up to most in the world. They could take whatever I threw at them. My hopes, my insecurities, the lessons I learned, I put everything I had into that battle. And in return, Siegfried and Percival gave me everything they had. Fighting the two of them was as intense as you'd expect. But once I got over my throbbing calves and aching deltoids, I felt really lucky. I had good people looking out for me. They showed me how far I'd come. I could go the distance. I went back to the castle, determined to hide everything from Lancey. He had enough on his plate. But you know how best friends are. Trying to keep secrets from them is like trying to hide an onion in a muffin. He cornered me. So, with nowhere left to run, I spilled the beans. Told him how the rumors had drained my confidence, and I didn't feel good enough to be his vice captain. Or his best bud. I felt horrible. I had the greatest friends in the skies telling me they believed in me. And still, I couldn't believe in myself. Lancey waited for me to get everything off my chest before speaking. Vane, I recommended you for vice captain because I considered you the most qualified. The motion passed because the king and the white dragons felt the same way. And just like that, a weight was lifted. Seems like all I really needed was to know my best friend trusted me. 
And now that we reestablished this trust, there is only one thing left to do. Beat each other silly. We snuck out to the training grounds in the middle of the night and sparred until our legs gave out. Then, we lay spread eagle on the ground, looking up at the stars. Those little twinkling dots were so inspiring. They're out there, a, a billion miles away. But still, their light manages to reach us. My dream of becoming a hero might be far off. But if the stars can make the trip, so can I. So this next adventure began on a day in Zega Grande like any other. The sun was shining, the birds were chirping, and I was soaking up some rays after a pleasant morning of grocery shopping. That's when I heard it. Long live the Blue Sky Knights! Yes, the fierce cry of a child in its natural habitat. Enough to strike fear into the heart of any warrior. I've never seen you around here. Intruder alert! Intruder alert! Knights, assemble! Cannonball formation! They came hurtling at me, faster than the wind. I stood no chance. We're the Blue Sky Knights, servers of justice and roasters of villains. Who goes there? But all jokes aside, these tykes were adorable. Reminded me of my own days playing knights and dragons. With both hands in the air, I thought long and hard about how to respond. I for sure didn't want to pull out my usual, I'm Vane, Vice Captain of the White Dragons. I mean, capturing a real knight while playing make-believe would be an awkward sitch for the kids. But it also wouldn't be right to lie. Then, a candle lit up over my head. I'm Vane, the Wayfaring Chef. Wait, you're a chef? That means you're an expert at brewing stews and baking pastries, correct? I blinked. I hadn't expected such an energetic response. What? Oh, yeah. And I've got the proof right here. I pulled out a bag of cookies, which may or may not have been meant for Vern and Lyria. But they'd understand, right? I'll bake them some more. <clears throat> Anyways, I passed out the cookies, and in the space of a few bites, the tots were leaping around like it was their birthday. And yes, before you say anything, I do realize that bribing the future defenders of our sky with munchies might not have been the best for character building. But <sighs> you should have seen their smiles.
have some potential, Sir Chef. I'll let you cook for us as our square. I'm Skip, by the way, captain of the Blue Sky Knights. We were on to headhunting already? These kids didn't mess around. I'm honored, Captain Skip. But to tell the truth, I'm kind of busy right now. Oh no. They were hitting me with a pout of despair and the eyes of the puppy dog. I bit my lip. This little game wouldn't take too long, right? Still, it has always been my dream to cook for the Blue Sky Knights. Squire Vane, at your service. I just didn't have it in me to rain on their parade. After dubbing me in a formal ceremony, Captain Skip raised his tiny fist in the air. We got our chef! Next, we have to search for a base. Split up, soldiers! We meet back here in one hour! The rest of the kids responded with a rousing cheer. And then, they were off. Hey! Sir Chef! That means you too! I saluted. Couldn't disobey direct orders from a commanding officer. Anyways, I still had time to spare. I was gonna find these kids the coolest base ever. Yeah! They won't know what hit them! Captain said there's some good spots around here. Just gotta make sure they're safe. Looks like this place is already occupied. Two on this! Done and dusted. Now, let's look for safer real estate. More monsters. This is definitely not a kid friendly joint. <laughs> Monster territory. Ah, oh, man. Clancy and I used to love exploring the woods. Nah, no place. Shit. 
Shady and secure is good, but hard pass on the claustrophobia. Spacious, but a dead end like this could be dangerous. No monsters, perfect size and location? I think I see a path on the other side of that thicket. I bet it leads to Folka. Captain Skip! I think I found it! I led the kids to a sweet glade I discovered in the woods. It was right next to a big thoroughfare, so they wouldn't have to worry about monsters or getting lost. I mean, if I could find my way back, then anyone could. Still, the place was surrounded by some nifty bushes and trees that shaded it from prying eyes. All in all, I think I did pretty well. And, judging from all the frolicking going on, the tykes agreed. Captain Skip pulled out a handmade flag that he'd apparently just been carrying around and stuck it in the ground. This land is now the hideout of the Blue Sky Knights! And sure, the thought, technically knights don't have hideouts flashed into my mind, but you can't expect kids to know that. Actually, you know what? These tykes might be onto something. Maybe I should ask Lancey for our own secret base later. Anyway, for the time being, I was in what had to be one of the top 10 hideouts in all the skies. I found a nice plush patch of moss and plopped down. It was a good day. Every time the crew touched down in Folka, I would make a beeline for the Blue Sky Hideout. Half of it was me being a responsible adult and wanting to make sure the tykes were okay, but there was also the call of duty. Wouldn't be much of a chef square if I let the troops go hungry, would I? Don't worry, I didn't stuff the kids with just carbs. I also fed them knowledge. Things like what fruit to eat, what shrooms and plants were poisonous, how to tell if a flower had edible nectar and where to hide from monsters. Lesson number one, though, was how to locate drinkable water. The kids were living on the edge of a forest, after all. One day, this information could save their lives. For now, at least, it was all in good fun. And the tykes were loving it. Whenever I gave them a demonstration, they'd rush to repeat it. Nine times out of ten, they'd fail, but instead of getting discouraged, they started a race to see who could get it right the fastest. 
And I'd always get this strange feeling that I'd traveled back in time. Back to when I was a square, I, I mean, a squire, a fiend rock, just beginning to discover the world. Hey, Sir Chef, see that bug up there? You think you can catch it? Gotcha. All right, gather around, knights. So, this little guy is super good at sensing monsters. Whenever danger approaches, he's the first to hide. There's actually a rhyme about it. Goes, bug on tree, monster free. Bug in ground, monsters around. Those kids were the most inquisitive students you could hope to meet. Soaked up knowledge like a sponge. If I had to choose just one lesson I wanted them to take away, though, it would be know when to ask for help. Because reaching out to others isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign of trust. And without trust, you can't build an order of knights or any relationship. Growing up doesn't mean you have to solve all your problems alone. I hoped the kids wouldn't lose sight of that, as I once did. One sunny afternoon, I was heading to the woods with the tykes when I saw a boy crouched in the shadow of the city walls. Who's he? An innocent question. The captain Skip glowered and folded his arms. Just some weirdo from Tempeel. He always looks like his balloon just popped. Once, I asked him if he wanted to be a knight, and he started crying. It's probably better to just leave him alone. Ugh. Skip ended this bit with a snort that said, And that's that. But I couldn't help glancing back at the boy. There was something about him that seemed so lonely. Hey, Captain Skip, this is just my humble opinion, but isn't the duty of a knight to help people? Especially those who kind of sort of look like they might be in need. <laughs> at this, Skip's face puckered up so hard, You'd have thought I squeezed lemon juice into his mouth. I got where the little dude was coming from, though. It wasn't always easy to do the right thing. But that's what made it so rewarding. You're not wrong, Sir Chef. Defending justice means defending the weak. Skip dashed over to the city walls. After what looked like a pretty one-sided conversation, he came back with the boy in tow. Say hello to the newest member of the Blue Sky Knights! I couldn't keep from smiling. In that moment, Skip and the lonely boy were the mirror image of Lancey and me when we were kids. It didn't take long for noobs and the rest of the tykes to become fast friends. Oh, that's the nickname they gave to the boy from Tempeel, by the way. Noobs. Within weeks, noobs had transformed into one of the brightest and most active kids in the city. But he'd had a reason to be sad. Turned out, noobs had lost his parents in the Tempeel incident. He'd moved to Folka after being adopted by relatives. Poor kid deserved some sweetness in his life. After all that bitterness, I did what I could for him, bringing my best creations to the Blue Sky Hideout. Today's special was one of Lancey's favorites, Vane's Paradise Pudding. Smooth, creamy, and so very rich. The sugar had apparently put the kids in a talkative mood. They'd barely gotten their spoons out of their mouths when they started competing for the title of best food commentator. Eventually, this evolved into a debate on which vein creation was the tastiest. Captain Skip claimed it was the cookies I'd given them the day we met, because they were seasoned with memories. Pretty poetic for a kid of, like, seven. I love those cookies too, though. They're a recipe from Grandma. Even Noobs was eager for a piece of the action. Warm my heart to see the shy little guy come out of his shell. But you know how it is with this world. The skies are clearest to ride before the storm.
My next visit to Folka? I could tell something was wrong as soon as I stepped foot in the city. All the adults stood huddled outside their homes, discussing, arguing. You were weeping. Turns out, it was the Tykes. They had gone missing. The news hit me like an oncoming airship. I remembered how to breathe again. I rushed over to Ace. One blue sky knight had stayed behind. What do we do? What if they never come back? I'll find them, I promise. You need to tell me what happened. It started with news. Still unused to the layout of Folka, we'd gotten lost in the woods. After about six hours, Skip put together a search team and went after him, without telling any adults. Now a full day had passed, and all four, Noobs, Skip, Beats, and Fessa, still hadn't returned. The whole time he was talking, Ace was shaking from head to toe. I put both my hands on his shoulders and gave him the warmest smile I could muster. You did good, Ace. Now leave the rest to me. I went straight to the Grand Cipher. Needed to recruit as many eyes as I could get. Those kids were my friends, and the future of the skies. I wasn't going to let anything happen to them. Hold on, guys. I'm coming for you. There have to be traps! Keep your eyes peeled! I taught them how to camouflage themselves in this grass. They probably head out for monsters around here. You don't think the monsters have already gotten to them? No, they're okay. They have to be. I'll teach you. Let's go! It's over. You're all mine! Still more to come! I'm ready. Let's get going. You got it. Water hasn't dried up yet. We have to be close.
moment. Thanks. You did good, Sir Chef. Skip still had enough in him to put on a brave face. That was a good sign. As I checked the rest of the tykes for injuries, I could feel that familiar tingle in my tear ducts. But I held it in. Kids have gone through enough. Without a grown man showering them in snot. I'm so glad you pulled through. The blue sky nights really are amazing. Captain Skip immediately lightened the mood by trying to fit his hands around my biceps. Whoa! I had no idea you were so strong. Fern, who'd been hovering nearby, crossed his paws. You think those tree trucks are just for show? Vade's a trained knight, vice captain of the White Dragons. The White Dragons? Wait, Sir Chef, you were an actual knight? Oh no. The upturned eyes of betrayed innocence. The ultimate technique. I started to sweat. I mean, yes, technically, but. I hadn't actually lied to them, but. Hiding the truth was just as bad. I steeled myself for the eruption, but it never came. Wow, a real knight? You need to let me interrogate you for my notes later. No wonder you kicked butt! Dude, awesome! I should have known. Those kids would never turn on a friend. I wish I could say all's well that ends well, but unfortunately it doesn't work like that. As we started back for Folka, I decided the kids and I needed to have a serious talk. All right, spill it. Why'd you all go into the woods alone? Noobs was in trouble, and you know, it's the duty of a knight to help people. I just thought we had to save him. Skip spoke down to his shoes. I felt my heart drop. It's the duty of a knight to help people. Those had been my words, so I was to blame for this whole mess. Skies above, why do I always, always... But before I could chase this dark train of thought any further, a small tug on my sleeve brought me back. All those survival skills you taught us really helped. Yeah! Thanks to you, we were able to properly locate food and water, and hide from monsters. I was so proud of them. But now was not the time to encourage their recklessness with praise. Do you realize how worried everyone was? If anything bad happened, your friends would be hurt big time, and not to mention your families. Yes, as knights, you have a duty to protect, but as people, you have a duty to your loved ones. So remember, the Tykes chimed in for this next line. Know when to ask for help. Okay, now it was time to be proud. Crouching so I was eye to eye with the blue sky knights, I held out my pinky. It's a promise, okay? An oath between knights.
I recently returned to Folka to find the Tykes holding a serious discussion. According to Skip, they were in big trouble for marching deep into the woods without adult supervision. As punishment, the Blue Sky Knights had to disband. The kids didn't look too upset, though. Au contraire. Skip stood, feet apart, head high, one fist reaching for the sky. Today, we form the Order of Vain. Guess they'd found a loophole. I mean, what do the grown-ups expect? These kids were joined at the hip. No one's found the hideout yet. I say we train there till we're all super cool knights like Vane. <laughs> well, I'm kids in their stupid dreams, right? You know, I never thought that one day I'd have a group of mini-me's. Which is nice, but also kind of scary. Because what if you set a bad example, let them down the wrong path, and on and on? It's enough to make you want to run and hide. But that's not what knights do. We stand our ground. We support each other. And with the best friends in the skies looking out for me, I know I can become just the kind of hero these kids deserve. Have a nice day! to view the request. Once upon a time, in a land far away, there was a lone swordsman famed for his two-sword style. He became a legend after fighting over 10,000 battles. And the mere sound of his name struck fear into the hearts of his enemies. Whenever he appeared in town, ne'er-do-wells were said to scramble away like spiders fleeing the light. Prospective fighters began to seek out the swordsman, and thus he gained quite the following of disciples. Amongst them, some were so strong they could crush warships with a single strike. One could do worse when choosing students of the martial arts. So the master abandoned the battlefield for the mountains, where he could train his beloved disciples in peace. There was one disciple who quickly stood leagues above the rest. It took her only a matter of days to master the most complicated techniques. She grew at an astonishing rate into one of the most powerful fighters the Master had ever seen. But more impressive than her wits or her aptitude was the strength of her conviction. Every day the top disciple begged for harder training, and the Master was willing to reward her passion with the very depths of his knowledge. And that's why... Why? Oh, skies help me. That's why when the Master found out his top disciple had betrayed him, he was filled with anguish. She went rogue, forcing some of the other disciples to do her bidding. Eventually, the Master caught up with her, and they fought a deadly battle. When the dust settled, the top disciple's sword arm hung limp and unusable. It was a bittersweet victory as the Master knew what must come next. He readied his blade, preparing to release her to the afterlife. But he couldn't force himself to make the cut. Not after all he had poured into this girl. Not after failing her so. Thus, he laid down his weapon and promised to live his remaining days in penance and regret. 
Oh, how our good intentions cloud even the most prescient vision. Having thrown away his name, his blade, and his path, he set out back into the world. But this time, swearing no one would suffer from his tutelage again. Time passed, and the swordsman found himself atop a different mountain, where he learned he had a knack for fishing. Suited him just fine. Bass for breakfast, salmon for supper, and naps in between. Yep, <laughs> it suited him just fine. It was the quiet, healing life of a hermit. Sometimes, when he needed supplies, he would go down to the village and train the locals in a little sword work. That made his coin purse jingle again. But this piece wasn't to last for the swordsman. He discovered his top disciple was back to her wicked ways, and, sword in hand, he vowed to conclude her story for good. This was his true purpose for traveling with the crew. Though the young captain never suspected the little Harvin fisherman was harboring such a dark secret. The former disciple's latest victim had been a simple man from a remote mountain area, cut down, somehow, without the use of her sword. A real shame, that. One more innocent life lost before its time. The swordsman asked the crew to make haste to the village. When he saw the murdered man's corpse, such was the carnage that he could barely keep from averting his eyes. It was his weakness, his cowardice, that cost this poor man's life. But this time, instead of wallowing in pity, he would don his white uniform of old and atone. He called it his burial garb, and it represented his fearlessness on the battlefield. If he were dressed to meet death face to face, what more could his foes do to intimidate him? Of course, his crewmates tried to reason with them. Concerned he might throw his life away to make up for the wrongdoing of another. But the Swordmaster was determined. He had vowed to stop his former disciple, whatever risk that entailed. So, when finally the moment of reckoning had come, the Master gripped his blade, ready to strike down his favored pupil. Before he could do the deed, however, his resolve crumbled. His emotions were too strong dulling his senses and causing him to lose the match. The master's former youngest disciple, with his two newest pupils watching from the sidelines, rushed to aid him. Ironically, it was the youngest disciple who struck down the fiend in place of the master. The swordsman was lost in grief, but his newfound champion told him this was for the best. After all, such an old life deserved the rest of its days to be spent in peace. After joining up with the crew, I've had some helter-skelter days, let me tell you. So when we arrived in Zega Grande, I knew I needed to get myself some fishing done. <laughs> Reset the old noggin. Found a nice quiet pond and dropped my line. Bless me taters. Must have been hours past with no bite. Finally, I decided to pull up my rod and check if the bait was still hardy. But there weren't no baits, no hook, and no fish. Only a lonely little bobber remained on the line. Right, well, what about me traps? I was halfway through the search when I realized, blast, 
I left him in the lodge. What a day, what a day. But it was too late in the noon to go back for him, and I had other business to attend to, like getting back to the pond and staring out at the clear water. In that moment of stillness, the fishies swam out of their hiding spots. There were big ones and little ones, and the whole school of them reminded me of my teaching days. Each of my disciples was unique in their own right. Had me some slow learners and some fast ones, some goody two-shoes and some real punks. I learned me some good lessons from those kids. My top student, Grace, never wavered in her particular sense of justice. And her commitment to her training was ironclad. What a waste. Range, my youngest pupil, lost his way for decades after leaving my tutelage. But he ended up killing Grace in my stead. He was selfless, thinking only of his master. They say the master extracts potential from the student. But I fear I've ruined more young lives than I've helped. Makes a fisherman wonder how they all would have turned out had he just kept well enough to himself. I turn Grace into a monster. Not a day goes by I don't regret honing her skills. Unfortunately, she had the gift and the gumption to go far, and I exhausted all my knowledge on her. If only I had focused more on the why of my teachings rather than the what. Huh? I swore I felt a nibble at my rod, but when I pulled it up, there was nothing to be found. That's when I remembered I still hadn't hooked or baited the line. That was odd. I was getting antsy. Maybe it was because I forgot the traps, but I couldn't relax just sitting there anymore. I decided to pack up and head back into town. You see, the mind is like a creek. You want to keep it healthy. You got to keep the waters from stagnating. But churn them too much, and you risk losing all your fish. I decided to head to Sierra's shack and replace some fishing gear, hopefully restoring my brain pond in the process. But just as I was dipping my toes into the placid waters of the lures and baits, I heard a rustle from behind. And to my surprise, they were my crewmates, picking up a package. Said they were bored at the inn and asked that they could come fishing with me. Youngsters so bored they wanted to go fishing? <laughs> First time for everything, huh? While I was hammering out the finer points of fly casting with the captain, Sierra Carte piped up. Said she'd come across a pretty tasty rumor. Yep. Apparently, there's a legendary fisherman in this skydom that people have started calling the Fisher God. I'd heard rumors like this one before, and they always stank like fish guts. Catching ten fish with one cast, netting a whole consortium of crabs. By yourself? Yeah. If I had a fin for every story like this, I'd be a pretty scary sea monster by now. Then again, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't intrigued. There's a scale of truth to every story. So there must be a reason they call this person the Fisher God. Guess you might say my interest was piqued. Because if this fellow were half as good as me, he'd make a mighty fine rival. And maybe that's just what I needed. After some consideration, I decided I would test my mettle against this so-called Fisher God. 
The captain, Lyria, and Vern wanted to help out too. I asked around town where I might find such a rival, but he proved to be as mythical as his title suggested. Rumor had it that he appeared at ponds, peaks, and valleys. The others garnered about the same information, which only further piqued my interest. No matter who we asked, we could not catch the proverbial tale of the Fisher God. All we learned was that he was skilled, able to catch ten fish with one cast, yada yada, and any new species he caught would be named after him, meaning there were lots of little demigods swimming around now. With only tales of his escapades to feed us, and no concrete info, we grew weary. You can't sustain a healthy rivalry on rumor, after all. We needed to change our approach and re-examine the facts. All of the stories were about places he visited, meaning he'd never been spotted in town. With that in mind, we enlisted Sierra Carte to speed up the investigation. Sure enough, after a few days' time, she gave us a map dotted like it had the chicken box. There were stamps on ponds and lakes, glaciers and volcanoes, and even a poisonous swamp. All of them locations where he'd been spotted. So, the old fart got around, did he? Good to know he had an adventurous streak. After staring at the map for a while, I realized there was one place conspicuously without a stamp. It was the most dangerous island of all, known for the molten lava covering its surface. Going off my hunch, Sierra Carte did a little more digging around, and we learned a man with a fishing rod chartered a ship there a few days ago. The chase was on. Keep up if y'all can! <laughs> now, where's this fisher god? That's no good. Did we wake the spirits of this land? While evil walks, justice never sleeps. <laughs> you make a good never point. Never let a catch slip away. Are you really gonna fish in a dangerous place like this? Of course. We're not dealing with your average angler here. This is a fisher god we're after now. He should have left supplies or traps or something. Uh, you don't have to be a But we gotta be careful while we search. Red like a book. Schooled like a fish. Played like a fiddle. Ah, don't scare me like that. Red like a book. Now, if I were a fisher god, this is probably the bait I'd use. Just a hunch, though. Careful now! Those spirits look angry! Those are the ones that explode if you beat them too hard. School like a fish, slave like a fish. Red like a bull. Reel him in. We've come pretty far. This eat is killing. Just a matter of time before we're there. Now hop to it. Huh? Try Looks like stop. somebody came through here, and they were collecting magma worms. Schooled like a fish. Whoa, I see somebody. Maybe it's the Fisher God. Very well could be. Give him a hello and see what's up. Hey there. Can we talk a minute? Mister, 
What the heck are you doing out here? <laughs> What's it look like? I'm fishing. What fish? You might catch a few rocks of anything at all. We fish, therefore they are. It's the deepest waters what hide the greatest prizes. The proverb left his lips like a right prophet. This had to be our fisher god. Uh, I still don't get how fish could survive in lava. And that's your problem. His answer was cryptic, but it had its own logic. The Captain Lyria and Vern cocked their heads to the side in confusion. Clear water or molten rock, cast the rod and catch the fish. <laughs> Truer words were never spoken, friend. <laughs> Guess I've learned me something over the years. Those unblinking eyes, that unrelenting hunger for the catch. His tools were top notch. More importantly, however, he had the aura of a man born to hunt the seas. But I didn't come to admire him. May we presume you are the Fisher God? And to what do I owe the accusation? What do you say to a little fish-off betwixt the two of us? Ah, now there's a song to my ears. It would be my honor. And thus, the net was cast. We fish, therefore they are. It was a profound statement. Hang your line thinking you won't catch anything and you won't notice even the heftiest bite. Determination was the most essential tool in the old tackle box. But then again, we were sat up next to a lava lake, and I would need more than simple chutzpah to pull a fish out of there. Luckily, I had me secret weapons. Someone came prepared. <laughs> Beautiful, ain't they? I strung a special hook, carved from a flame worm's tooth, to a special line, spun from its mane. Been looking forward to the day I could bust out these bad boys. Whoa! You're really going to do this? The Captain, Burn, and Lyria were stunned as I cast my rod into the lava. Just what the heck are you old-timers expecting to catch? Vern's voice was filled with confusion, but wasn't a moment longer when we made a believer out of him. Oh, a bite! <laughs> Me too! The fisher god and I started pulling up catch after catch. <laughs> it seemed like we both brought determination to spare. But the fish living inside the lava weren't no slouches neither. They were covered in armor-like scales, and when we pulled them ashore, their flopping sent liquid death flying in every direction. <laughs> Was kind of funny. So there we were, equally matched, neither side willing to back down. As our piles of molten fish gradually turned to hills, the Captain Lyria and Vern were dumbstruck. Soon enough, our sword backs told us it was time for a gentleman's break, and we decided to tally our scores. We counted each fish as we threw them back into the lava. Their physiology meant they couldn't be cooked. Don't want no sulfur in my sushi anyway. <laughs> but they sprang back alive as soon as they were returned to their familiar warmth. Should've known you'd be a shark on the rod. <laughs> Just trying to keep up. It was a rare thing to meet your match. The smiles on our faces were proof of that. Burn flew up to us. Do all old dudes fish like that? If you went for broke, I wonder who would come out on top. The fisher god and I locked eyes. We could feel the sparks flying. Sounds like the gauntlet's been thrown. Agreed. We've had enough of a warm-up. Then you won't mind if we up the ante, huh? He told us about a few local legendary fish that had eluded capture for years. Reminded me of the noble Benito from good old Fanta Grande. 
We agreed the winner would be the first to trap one of them fabled guppies. The prospect sent lightning through me body. The old spark was coming back. <laughs> Now I just had to track me down a living, swimming myth. Couldn't be that many lakes harboring legends, right? Turns out there were few eyewitness accounts of such fish. Guess they didn't like flashing their scales as much as the fisher god. But I knew they had to exist. Why would he make up the challenge? So back to Sierra we went. She kindly asked the fishermen's guild and scholars to lend their assistance. They told us of a potential target. A beautiful fish, said to have the loveliest iridescent scales in the world. But it had never been caught, so it had yet to receive a proper name within academia. As if to tempt me more, we learned the locals called it the Jewel Fin. Catching it would be like grabbing a cloud, but the more I heard, the more I needed it. Surely it was a fool's errand. <laughs> Too bad I was beside myself with determination. A being that existed somewhere between reality and rumor? I had to catch me some of that. Thus, in the coming days, whenever I found a semi-reliable lead, I would fly to the spot and cast my line. Went to salt lakes where a sip of the water would dry you to the bone. Wandered around underground streams where you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And then every place in between. The captain, Lyria, and Vern accompanied me on my flights of fancy. But they grew tired of the pace. I wouldn't force them. I had planned to make the trip alone anyhow. All I wanted to do was find the unfindable. To catch the uncatchable. It was a good sign, honestly. They say anticipation exists right before accomplishment. Take a new sword technique. You only perfect it the day before a duel. A consequence of free battle nerves sending your noggin into overdrive. And this fish-off was a duel to the death for me and the fisher god. It would be the accomplishment of the century for any who lived by the rod. I was having the time of my life. But I knew I didn't have forever. We were in this skydom for a reason, and that mission had to take precedence. I decided my next search would be the last. It brought me to a labyrinthine jungle, which had claimed many adventurers in the past. I heard that somewhere inside was a spring turned monster den. One look at its bewitching twinkle would be enough to drive a man mad, and he'd throw himself into the pool to be swallowed. Relying on those exaggerated claims for guidance, I braved the forested depths to discover not a glorious spring, but a regular old bog. Yeah, Ain't no legendary fish ever lived in a place like that. But still, I cast my rod, and Vern and the captain waited with bated breath as they watched me bobber a bobbin. The swamp remained quiet. I was neither overcome with anticipation nor bored from inaction. I was part of the stillness, and my rod was my connection to it. I was one with nature and leap and liver fish a bite. I tugged the fish to the surface and began to tear up as the most perfect, lustrous twinkle broke the murky waters. Turns out none of the scholars' descriptions were quite right. But this was it. This was the jewel fin of legend. How's this for a catch? I proudly displayed the jewel fin before the fisher god. Its scales glistened in iridescent waves, unreal in their beauty. Its fins ethereal and transparent, waved as if kissed by a breeze. That old coot was flabbergasted. Slap my behind! Where in the seven skies did you find this? <laughs> that was...
was a delicious reaction. But of course, the fisher god was a fisherman of taste, and he had a rebuttal prepared. It was a large fish, obsidian in color, whose scales seemed to drink the light like a void. Its dorsal was strong and stiff, as if to mark it as a sea king. Whoa! Two legendary fish? Isn't that nuts? Both of our catches fit the criteria of the competition. It was gonna be too hard to call. Guess we couldn't complain, though. Not every day we got to see such rare specimens. Still, something had to be done. So we turned to Lyria, Vern, and the captain. I think both are amazing. I've never seen such pretty fish. Can't we just say you're both incredible and be done with it? Guess two legendary fish don't make a champion. Especially when we were both set on wearing the crown. Nope, it didn't sit right with me. Our rivalry pushed the craft of fishing forward, hadn't it? There was fire in our guts, and we deserve to name a proper victor. Vern saw the determination plain on our faces. You guys aren't gonna let this go, are you? Game's back on, then. Lyria pondered for a moment and made a suggestion. How about whoever fishes up the most happiness? That could be interesting. A genius suggestion. This island was under Avia's control, terrifying the population. It would be a saintly move to give them cheer with a side of full bellies. It was settled. We would go with Lyria's suggestion. He who could bring the most happiness to the island would take it. After a nod to one another, the fisher god and I set out to do some real fishing. So, who's ready to shove off? Hope we come across a good fishing spot. <laughs> In this blizzard, how are you gonna even see your rod? <laughs> Ancient technique. Here, hole has a river at the bottom. Smell you later. We're just looking to fish, but if you want to be a sushi platter, step right up. Whether it's the bayou or the battlefield, patience is key. The thing over Take here, it. you got What do you think? Into my way. Smell you later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's over. Yeah. More where that came from. A man after my own heart. Can fish even live and weather this cold? The colder the weather, the fatter the fish. Make some good barbecue. Oh, that's me. Rose is sure to the cool every day. Hey. <laughs> 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 
much go. You are finished. You have had better. Huh? I'm with that. Of course. No running for me. Come now. Right. The lady gloves are off. They didn't see that coming. I can always For count sure. on you. Yep. That was a whale of a waddle. That spot looks well. This place is perfect. Let's get started. Holy crap. Looks like the monsters caught our scent. Curse their timing. Well, clean them up right quick. It's curse for you. Bury them. Slice it, guys. That was a doozy. <laughs> it was a long Smell you later. You can stop being! Crimson Tamayo! Run like a beautiful person! Ignore his attack! Right up! Right away! Stay close. It's I won't let them lay a finger on you. Oh, how cute. You think I need protection. Let's go! All hands on! Let's go! I wouldn't be so sure. Looks like we got a big fell on our hands next. For real? We don't have time for this. Yep. And judging by its bad attitude, I don't think it's gonna let us leave without a fight. Results day had arrived. Residents of Seed Hollow were gathering, waiting to see what bounty we could share. Feast your eyes. I have caught the elusive Brave Scale. The Fisher God took to the podium. The largest fish in this sky to strung up behind him. The crowd was wowed by the sheer scale of the thing. And I was no exception. Should have known he'd come out with rod blazing. But I, on the other fin, took a different approach. Behold! All these humble shalmen who make their home in these very rivers. 
I sure wasn't gonna win through size, but maybe superior numbers would do the trick. Next, the fisher god and I began to fillet our catches, sharing sushi, soup, and ceviche of all sorts with the crowd. The brave beam is delicious, and how do you beat that impact? The shellman is just as good. It's so fresh, and it's been served at the optimal temperature. Absolutely perfect. Everywhere we looked, there were people enjoying our efforts. Even the crew were getting their fill while they could. But since it was a competition, next up was evaluations. Members of the crowd were to vote on whose catch made them feel better, both in flavor and in general happiness. One after the other, the votes piled up for the Fisher God. It was starting to look hopeless. But there was a special reason I chose to serve the Shellman. I wasn't panicking just yet. Shall we call it there, friend? I gotta hand it to you, Fisher God. You serve some delicious fish. But let's see how it plays out. While I was talking, a cute little scamp, snot running down his nose and everything, cast a vote for me. You didn't want to vote for the big fish, sweetie? It was too big and scary. I like the small fishies. The fisher god's breath caught for a moment. And I knew he understood my plan. Yeah? All right. Come to view the requests. The Fisher God bowed his head and admitted I was the winner. But before I could humbly accept his withdrawal, Vern voiced honest confusion. Looking at the votes, you're the clear winner, aren't you? Not at all. Without this master of the rod opposite me, these results wouldn't have been possible. He spoke from the heart, moved me a bit to hear that he understood me through and through. It's ordinary fish, ones we consume daily, that bring us health and happiness. Delicacies shine because they're a rare treat, but well-being is built on something more than rarity. Hearing that youngster speak, I understood what Yodarha was trying to tell me. The fact I couldn't surmise for myself is proof of my hubris. He continued, I guess what I'm trying to say is, a child's smile will do more for a village's well-being than all the legendary fish in the sea. That's what I should have been aiming for. A smirk sat on his lips as he turned to me. Congratulations, Yadarha. Even had I won this competition, I concede in our fish-off. You are the rightful victor. I've learned much from our duel. I thank you from the depths of my heart. Never in my days had I met a more worthy gentleman. <laughs> and you, good sir, help this old minnow rediscover his love of the sport. After the voting had concluded, the townsfolk were still savoring our dishes. Both Brave Bream and Shalman were a hit. The satisfied smiles of the people were evidence of this. But as all good things must come to an end, so too did the feast. Despite the mountain of fish we started with, not a single fillet was left. I turned to the Fisher God, a gleam in my eye. And though he just admitted defeat, his eye held the same twinkle. You want a race to see who can get this place spick and span quicker? We were no longer rivals. We were brothers of the rod. And this little competition would tide us over till our next real match.
were shopping at Sierra's when the merchant herself popped up from behind the counter. Apparently, she'd been waiting on us, ready to share the latest seaworthy gossip. A certain rumor swam earlier this month. You see, people are saying there are two fisher gods working this skydom. Would you know anything about that? Vern and Lyria gasped in surprise before turning to give me a curious look. <gasps> Could it be? <laughs> you know, I never meant to keep making a name for myself, but old habits die hard, don't they? Sounds like quite the handsome fella. Can't wait to meet him. All right, see you. Foul smell fills the air as my dissolving limbs grow black. Protect the captain! Get him somewhere safe! No, leave me. Run. As long as you're alive, we can rebuild. We promised, didn't we? Our lives are in your hands. You're not allowed to make the sacrifice for me. Please, save yourselves. I'll never forget the memory of that day. My conceit put us in that mess, but I was the only one who made it. After all the good times we shared, after all the pain, they would have to live on in my memory. Once I could pick myself back up again, I began to temper my body. I swore I'd never let the same tragedy repeat itself. It wasn't long before this husk became resilient, augmented and conditioned to withstand even lightning. I no longer felt physical pain, or much of anything at all. It was preferable that way. I could be a shield to protect others, to protect them from the same tragedy that befell my crew. Having lost my place in the world, I found a home in the society and quickly became contractor to the seal weapon, Great Scythe Grinoth. My missions were simple, hunt primal beasts or exterminate the foe. I did my job so that I could keep people safe, to aid them in their time of need. But despite my best efforts, I still failed. I was powerless when Vern was kidnapped right in front of me. Worst of all, I could do nothing but watch as our hopeful new recruit was cut down. What good was I when I couldn't even protect a single one of my comrades? <sighs> Maybe the real mistake was believing I could do good in the first place. I joined the society to protect others which sounds noble on paper, but in reality, it was all for my own sake. I'm the reason that my old crew, my family, found an early grave. It was only right that I spend the rest of my meager life in atonement. At least, that's the excuse I told myself. In truth, another part of me was deluded into thinking I could free myself from the guilt but only if I could change into another person. Turns out that being immune to physical torture does nothing to protect your heart from psychological torment. 
Speaking of mental suffering, not long after I joined the society, Ilsa assigned Zeta as my partner. The old me would have worked with her just fine, but too much had changed. Her blunt honesty rubbed me the wrong way. A man can only take so much random commentary before he goes insane. Even Ilsa called her pupper, which was kinder than what I had in mind back in those days. But it was an apt name, considering all of her barking. I didn't care about forging a real partnership with Zeta. Every time we had a mission together, I just wanted to finish it as fast as possible. But it backfired. Whenever I pushed her away, she pushed back ten times harder. She was determined to know me. I would have never admitted it out loud, but I was afraid. After all, the closer you are with someone, the harder it is to cope with their loss. As for why I joined the captain's crew, well, I had my reasons. The captain's father was awaiting our crew in Estelucia, and that meant duking it out with primals and gathering sky map pieces along the way. The captain was strong and humble, had a knack for overcoming hardship. With leadership like that, I knew this crew could actually make it. That's not to say they were running a flawless operation. The way I saw it, they had two big problems. Vern and Lyria, the Red Dragon and the Girl in Blue. It's true they were core members of the crew, but they possessed powers which could represent grave consequences for the skies. Should one overflow with astral energy, or the other absorb enough primal power, they would be erased and herald the destruction of everything as we know it. It was possible the captain could reach Estelucia without any sacrifices, but I wasn't the type to bet on fate. These kids needed a shield. This body of mine would protect them all, no matter what came to pass. At least, that's what I intended. During the fight against the Moon Dwellers, I lost myself to the Atomagod Grinoth's power and raised my scythe against the crew. As pathetic as it was, I became the very threat I swore to protect them from. That was why I prepared a way to stop my own heart. I wouldn't hurt my comrades again. If I couldn't protect anyone, then the least I could do was make sure I could do no more harm. What are you playing at, Vasaraga? Was this your penance after what happened to Lester? I was fine with sacrificing myself as long as I could save someone else. A part of me even believed I deserved such a fate. I... I hate when you act alone. You could have come to me for help first, you know? We're partners, damn it! I couldn't feel pain, but... somewhere inside I felt like a wound had split me in two. It took me far too long to realize that it hurt my comrades to see me suffering that I had chosen to run instead of face my fears. Did you hear me, you big lug? You're not gonna drop dead on us. Not on my watch. My partner's instincts were sharp enough to cut right through me. But it was her words, honest and blunt, which shattered the walls around my cowardly heart. The pain I should have dealt with a long time ago came spilling out, but this time... It was accompanied by a burning desire. We're going to survive this, together. And that's the way it's been ever since. in the morning, before the crew was to head out for a request, I headed to the forest surrounding Folka to conduct a test on Grinoth. On the way, I was stopped by the sight of a young girl watering the vegetable garden by her home, the wet plants sparkling beneath the morning sun. 
but something felt off about the scene. In contrast to the bright garden, a dark, foul mist seemed to surround the girl. <laughs> Upon noticing me, she scrambled back into her house. The miasma clung to her as she fled. Sorry, lass. Shouldn't have snuck up on you like that. But that odd mist looked too real to be an illusion, and yet it didn't seem to be doing any harm. I decided to keep an eye out. After all, Folka was bustling with the influx of refugees from Tempil, and there was no telling what could happen in strange times such as these. Grinoth ripped through the silence of the forest. As I lowered the scythe, the quiet returned. It was a perfect place for tuning the weapon. At least, it would have been had I not sensed the presence of someone watching. Whoever it was, they had yet to strike, so I assumed they were no threat. Perhaps they were one of Folka's residents. I know you're there. State your business. Turning around... I saw the familiar face of the mist-shrouded girl. That black armor... your big scythe? Her expression was blank, completely devoid of the cheer she had while watering her garden. Eventually, she spoke as tears welled in her eyes. I'm tired, Mr. Reaper. You can take me away now. The floodgates broke, a steady stream cascading down her cheeks. Mr. Reaper? What are you talking about? I only wanted to grow those little ones. But everything I do hurts them. They all rot away. All I do is cause pain. The girl hung her head and grew silent. It was obvious she had given up on life. It was a feeling I was all too familiar with. Once you've steeled yourself for death, you start thinking there's no other way out. But before I could console her, a monster appeared from the brush and leapt at the girl. I felled it in a single blow, but she gasped at the grisly sight. Fear appeared in her eyes. Good. If she could still fear death, then she wasn't too far gone. Sorry to disappoint, but I'm no reaper. Most I can manage is to bring you safely home. You'd rather not be Monster Kibble, right? I... Need to gather your thoughts? I get it. Life rarely gives us obvious choices. Okay... Keep close. Maybe it was just a trick of the light, but I saw a bit of life return to her gaze. I took a step back toward the village, ready to prove I was no Reaper of the Afterlife. Time to go home. Should be this way. didn't feel like an earthquake to me. Paths blocked by a boulder. Weird. It wasn't here before. Hmm. Let's look around. Someone's hungry. Stand back. I'll take care of it.
You can't stop fear! They're going to bring the heat now. You should run. You're not worth risking your life for. I said I'd bring you home. Besides, I've faced worse than this before. What do we do about that boulder? I know another way back. It'll take longer, but... Fine by me. You take the lead. Stop me! Come if you dare! I feel eyes on us. We're not alone. Zombies! I've got them. For life! What's that? Ready to go? Yeah. Try and stop me! What is that? You look exactly like a reaper. Come if... I guess I'm no slouch with the sight. Roger, I'll observe for now. So, what's this whole obsession with death about? You don't have to answer, but just remember, once you die, that's it. Don't be so hasty to throw your life away. Battalions of fear! Are you sure you weren't a reaper? Even if I was, it's not your time yet. Not today. Upon arriving at the girl's home, I was met by a shocking sight. The thriving garden I'd seen before was now gray and withered, its fruits and vegetables rotting away. How could all the life have been sucked from this place in such a short span of time? When I looked at the girl, she purposefully avoided my gaze. I decided against questioning her for the moment. Whatever's going on, I might be able to help. But we can talk about that later. You should rest. Okay. She took an unsteady step through the door of her home. As I watched her go, I felt eyes on the back of my head. But when I turned around, no one was to be found. Yeah, I doubt I imagined that. I spent a few moments scanning the perimeter, but soon found nothing of concern. I decided to call it a day.
Curious about the girl in her garden, I headed once more toward the forest on the outskirts of Folka. Um, I never had a chance to thank you for the other day. Though she was more lively than before, her spirit was clearly drained. I guess it feels wrong to call you Mr. Reaper now. The name's Vasaraga. The girl introduced herself as Irene. As she spoke, I noticed her wrist was wrapped in a bandage. I asked if she was injured, but this caused her to grimace. Oh, this? Uh, it's fine. I just, uh, cut myself as all. In a thinly veiled attempt to change the subject, Irene offered me some juice made from homegrown fruit. This is the least I can do to thank you. Do you want to drink some together? Apple, not bad. We sat at her table and began to chat. She told me that she hailed from Grossgard, a small region near Seed Hollow. Having just moved to Folka, she was still a new face to the locals. Do you take care of the garden by yourself? Yes. Hmm. Tense. Holding in on herself like a withering flower, she became the complete opposite of the girl I watched happily watering her plants. But it was not her forlorn expression that gripped me. It was the mist. Ever her formless companion, a swirling miasma seemed just beyond her perception. There were far worse things in the skies than a little smoke, but I knew this was more than it seemed. Mind if I stop by again? I could visit between requests. I wanted to help her, but not out of a misguided sense of obligation. I just wanted to make sure she never forgot what it was like to smile. Wow, um, these vegetables are very... unique. Yes, unique. I brought Vern and Lyria with me in hopes of lifting Irene's spirits. How do you make a tomato look like a shriveled bone? That's talent, I guess. Vern was, for better or worse, brutally honest. Now who did that remind me of? Vern, don't be rude. It's fine, Lyria. He's not wrong. Though she had every right to be offended, Irene took the comment in stride. Our two most carefree members of the crew seemed to be rubbing off on her. Yes, it was the right call to bring them. I'm not the best at brightening the mood. So Vasaraga told us about your plan. You want them to grow big and healthy, but they keep withering, right? Yes. After a moment of silence, Lyria gave Irene a sympathetic smile, encouraging the girl to divulge her feelings. She began to perk up. Huh. Guess Zeta was right. It really is easier to share your worries with someone closer to your age. Taking care of those little ones is my purpose in life. She went on to recount how she had always been a loner. From a young age, her only friends were the plants she cared for. Recently, she had discovered that she could hear her plants talk, though she had no idea how or why. But now, it's like my precious friends are fading away, one by one. I don't know how much more of this I can take. Not long after she had gained the ability to communicate with her cherished plants, they suddenly began to wither and die one after another. She could hear them wail in agony as they reached their end. It was no surprise that she soon reached her breaking point. A few are still alive, but I'm sure they'll join the others in no time. If this is all that's waiting for me in the future, then I would rather not live to see it. Watching the lives of your loved ones slip out of your fingers? I could relate to that. What was she supposed to do? distance herself from her reason for living? Wasn't that as good as dying? I eyed the black mist. Look, there's gotta be a way to fix things. What? 
But I've tried everything. Squeezing her bandaged wrist, Irene looked up at me in confusion. I did my best to reassure her without betraying the worry gnawing at my mind. What happened here? I had stopped by Irene's garden after finishing our quest, only to find every single leaf and stem had turned black and rotted. It felt unnatural, like something had completely sucked the life from what should have been a thriving patch of greenery. Filled with dread, I rushed inside the house, but Irene was nowhere in sight. It was then that I noticed a letter on the floor. To the blasphemer who betrayed Avia. You should know that Lady Lilith wished to bathe the skies in destruction. Have you not yet realized that clinging to life is folly? That living is a sacrilege to all we preach? You have two choices before you. Watch as that forbidden implement spreads darkness to all those innocent folk living around you. Or return to Avia and repent. So Irene had ties to the Church of Avia, and they'd fitted her with some sort of cruel device. Reminded me of Lyria and the Mind Sealer. If they had hurt Irene like they hurt Lyria... Damn. Thought I'd finally dealt with this pain. But there I was, failing to protect yet another innocent life. Brooding on it for too long wasn't going to bring Irene back. So I left the house and scoured the town. Avia always had a flair for drama, but I detected no commotion in town. Which means, bastard snuck away in a ship. Knowing there were precious few minutes to trail them, I rushed to the port. The captain, who saw me rushing to the port, joined me in the chase. Sierra Carte, who was always in the right place at the right time, heard a rumor about an Aviath battleship sighting. We took after them immediately, driving the Grand Cipher as hard as we could to close the distance. Found you. After we crested a cloud bank, their ship came into view. In a contest of speed, a mere battleship was no match for the Grand Cipher. We soon pulled alongside our quarry and boarded their vessel. I assume you're the draft that's been stalking our new shaman? Let Irene go. I'm afraid that's out of the question. The tension in the air grew palpable. That device she wears incinerates life. For now, the dark flame only affects plants. But with a little more time, the Shaman will consume all life in Zega Grande. Lady Lilith will have her salvation, one way or another. You call that salvation? Maybe these fools didn't understand Lilith's true goals, or maybe they were just bending the truth to satisfy their own cruel desires. Regardless, they were hazards that needed to be taken care of. She shows remarkable compatibility with the Dark Flame. <laughs> we will use her to fulfill Lady Lilith's wishes once and for all. At the expense of Irene and this Skydom? Not on my watch. It's time someone put your schemes to rest. 
Grinoth, did you hear that? We've got work to do. Lend me your strength. Take them, Grinoth. Try and stop them. For Lady Lilith! For Lady Lilith! For Lady Lilith. These guys never know what to do. Call for reinforcements. We stop them here! Full bloom! <laughs> Rackham, you pull up alongside me. We need to board and find Irene. Of course! No kid is getting kidnapped on my watch! You too, Bane! What do you think? Fragrance, wouldn't you say? Come if you dare! For mercy now, outsiders! Our salvation will be as Lady Lilith foretold. Do you even know what Irene wishes for? I, I won't let you get out. What would she know? The shaman has a duty to embody Lady Lilith's teachings. Guess we're gonna not be sent into them the hard way. How could I? I'm so sorry, Lady Lilith. Accursed outsiders! Death the way! Come if you dare! Did you Try and stop me. me! You're safe now. Let's get you home. By the time we carried Irene back to the Grand Cipher, Half of her body was shrouded in the dark mist. A sinister-looking device was clamped around her wrist, where the bandage had slipped off. I don't advise using force to break it. That would put Lyria's life in danger. I remembered what Roland said back on Mount Nagelith. Removing one of these implements by force could cost Irene her life, but there was no time to search for another method. Hasraka. I'm sorry. I've caused you trouble again. Irene weakly apologized, barely conscious. It's okay. You can break the bracelet. My life is in your hands. As long as you're alive, we can rebuild. We promised, didn't we? Our lives are in your hands. I clenched Grinoth tighter. Irene had already accepted her end, but I... I swore to protect them. I swore to protect them all! With my heartbeat thundering in my ears, I focused my entire being on the device. Grinoth and I became one as I swung down. We cut through the dark mist, and a burst of blinding light swallowed everything. Come to view the request.
After some time had passed, I stopped by Irene's home while out on a request. Well, well. A comforting and familiar sight greeted me. The garden was bursting with vegetation, much like the first time I saw it. Basaraka! Standing amidst the greenery, Irene waved at me with a smile. I should apologize. You can't hear your friends anymore because of what I did. She shook her head, her smile still present. No, I shouldn't have let the church tempt me like that. I'm sorry for dragging you and your crew into my mess. A hint of sorrow graced her features. I can't hear these little ones anymore, that's true. But I can still tell what they want to say. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Sometimes your heart just knows these things. She turned to look up at the sky, a few tears sliding past her smile. Like how I knew to reach out to you, even if I thought you were the Reaper. <laughs> Thank you for saving me, Lasaraga. Anyone would have done the same. With a careful shuffle, I turned away. A dainty garden was no place for an armor-clad warrior to stomp about. I'll see you around, Irene. I took one last look at the vibrant garden before heading back to the ship. The morning had barely begun when Zeta came barreling over with a package addressed to me. It was stuffed full of fruit, which only confused her further. Huh? Aren't these Volca gold fruit? Lucky man! I heard their produce is all the rage these days! Whoops. Guess I hadn't told Zeta about Irene and her garden yet. Looks like the pantry is full. Help me carry these back to my room. Sure, but this is kind of a lot for a midnight snack. I figure being surrounded by a little more nature couldn't hurt. <laughs> Didn't take you for the crunchy type. Gonna grow your own orchard or what? She was joking, but honestly, it didn't sound like such a bad idea. Ever had fresh apple juice before? I'll make you some, as thanks for helping me carry everything. Wait a minute. You never put this much effort into treating me. Is this a trap? A skilled gardener taught me a trick or two. Never hurts to practice a new recipe. The vibrant fruit told me how well Irene was doing, much better than any letter could. Offering her garden a silent word of thanks, I was ready to enjoy its generous harvest. <laughs> 